we go. Unit 3, the heading is isotopes. Who can give me the definition of an isotope? Yes, atoms of the same element. In other words, they've got the same number of protons, but they've got different mass numbers, which means the number of neutrons. Um, when they ask the definition for isotopes in a test or an exam paper, we had specimen papers. They give isotopes two marks. So when we were discussing it, Everybody gives the definition of an isotope, atoms of the same element having different numbers of neutrons. 100% correct, one mark. Because they want you to explain atoms of the same element have the same number of protons. All right? So isotopes, atoms with the same number of protons, same atomic number. So please state it like that. Having different mass numbers, which means the number of neutrons differ. It's otherwise you're going to lose one mark. All right? Um, okay, the definition of an isotope. Atoms of the same element. Let's do this in a different color. Atoms of the same element. In other words, they've got the same number of protons. There we have it. Same number of protons. But they've got different numbers of neutrons. In other words, different mass numbers. Please... Um, especially if you see the definition counts two marks, explain atomic number and mass number. Do you understand? Okay. Um, now, we've done isotopes in grade 8, grade 9, and this year we have to go one little step further. Now, some isotopes are unstable. The reason being is the unstable isotopes often have more neutrons than the stable one. It's as if the nucleus becomes too large and it makes it slightly unstable. Now, when we get unstable isotopes, we find very often that they give off energy in the form of radiation. All right, uranium-238, isotope-238. Remember, uranium has got 92 protons. The mass number is 238. But there's a 234 and a 235 isotope as well. But the 238 one is especially unstable. Now, in an effort to become more stable, this nucleus gives off some energy. We call that energy radiation, and we talk about they are unstable, so they tend to decay, all right, break down or change by giving out energy. Now, radioactive decay, not all elements undergo radioactive decay. For example, carbon. Carbon has got two very common isotopes, carbon-12 and carbon-14. Carbon-12, how many electrons does carbon have? Six. It's atomic number six. So carbon-12 will have six protons, six neutrons. But carbon-14 will have six protons and eight neutrons. This makes carbon-14 unstable, and carbon-14 is radioactive. All right. Um, when something undergoes radioactive decay, also known then as nuclear decay or radioactivity or nuclear radiation, it's just different terms referring to the same basic thing. It is the process whereby an unstable atomic nucleus, for example, a uranium-238 or a carbon-14, okay, is going to give off energy. What must you remember? Where does this energy come from? The nucleus, okay. Normally, if I take a piece of wood and I throw it on the fire to burn, where does the energy come from? If I take a piece of wood and I put it on a fire and I burn it, where, where does the energy come from? What's the store of chemical potential energy? Where is it stored? In the bonds, okay. Remember, wood is a hydrocarbon fuel, so it consists of carbons, Bonded onto each other covalently and hydrogens bonded onto the carbons. When I burn wood, I break the carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds. Okay, it's a chemical bond that is broken. 
but from radiation or radioactive decay, the energy does not come from making or breaking chemical bonds. It comes directly from the nucleus. All right. The nucleus is unstable. And in an effort to become more stable, it gives off energy. All right. So it emits radioactive particles. There's the next thing by emitting radiation, and the radiation is an alpha particle, a beta particle, or gamma radiation. Now what happens is, an alpha particle, at this point you don't need to specifically know what an alpha particle is, but an alpha particle consists of two protons and two neutrons. So it's a fairly large particle two protons and two neutrons sticking to each other, and it's shot out from the nucleus. A beta particle is actually an electron that is shot out from the nucleus. Okay? Now, where do we get electrons? Around the nucleus. So where does an electron come that is shot out from the nucleus? A neutron forms a proton and an electron, and it's that electron that is shot out. Okay, that's what a beta particle is. Now, gamma radiation is not a particle. When a nucleus that is unstable shoots out a particle, there's a hole left. So the other protons and neutrons try and reorder themselves to fill that hole. Okay, they move closer together again. When this happens, a burst of gamma radiation is given off. From where can you, you, you won't know about gamma radiation, eh? Okay, gamma radiation is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's part of the radiation that enters via the sun. Okay, when we do waves, we'll come back to gamma radiation. But it's very high energy waves that are given off. Okay. Uh, three types of radioactive decay. Here we have Alpha decay, they talk about a helium nucleus. Why? Consists of two protons and two neutrons. If you look on the periodic table, helium, atomic number is two, the mass number is four. Okay, so they say a helium nucleus is split out without the electrons on the outside. No. Okay, normally helium has got two protons, two neutrons in the nucleus with two electrons on the outside. But a Helium nucleus is just two protons, two neutrons, no electrons. No. Okay, so a helium nucleus is shot out. That is known as alpha decay. It consists of two protons and two neutrons. Beta is an electron that is shot out. And remember I said it's a neutron that breaks up into a proton and an electron, and it's that electron that is shot out. All right? And then gamma radiation, well, we'll have a look at gamma radiation when we do waves. But it's also a form of energy that is given out, although it does not consist of a particle as alpha and beta. It's a nuclear bomb. It depends on what it does, but it can either shoot out alpha, beta, or gamma, or some are only alpha emitters together with gamma, some are only beta emitters together with gamma, and some only emit gamma radiation. It depends on what you've got. Okay. Now, you don't need to specifically know which one is an alpha, beta, or a gamma radiator. Okay. Um, if we're going to have a look at different isotopes, hydrogen, well-known element, element number one on the periodic table. It has an atomic number of one, and if you're going to have a look at the mass of hydrogen on the periodic table up on the board, it's 1.0079, so we round it off to one. So this tells us what about hydrogen? It consists of what? One proton, probably no neutrons, although the comma 0079 tells me, ooh, there's something else there. Now the mass on the periodic table is the average mass of all the isotopes of an element. In nature, these isotopes will occur in a fixed ratio. It's just a natural phenomenon. All right? 
The first one with no neutrons is 99.999% of them. And very few are these two. Okay, so when we add all the masses together and we work out the average in the ratio in which the isotopes occur, we get a mass of 1.0079. Okay? The first isotope of hydrogen is known as protium. It has one proton. And how many neutrons? How many neutrons? Zero neutrons. Remember, this number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. If the atomic number is one, there's one proton. If the mass number must be one, then there are zero neutrons. Then deuterium has got one proton and one neutron, so the mass is going to be two. Oh, you see. And the last one, tritium, has got one proton. It has to have one proton. It's hydrogen. If it has two protons, I no longer have hydrogen. Then I've got helium. Okay, so one hydrogen, uh, one proton there, but two neutrons to give me a mass of three. Do you follow? Okay. People, many elements have isotopes. Here's another example. Carbon, I spoke about carbon a little while ago. Three isotopes of carbon. When we talk about a specific isotope, I refer to it as carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. What does this refer to? The mass number. Okay. What does this refer to? Which element? Yes. And carbon has got six protons. Do you understand? Okay, so it tells me which element I have, but it also tells me specifically which isotope I have. Now, normally when we speak about carbon, we are referring to the average of them all. All right, now, people, carbon-14 is unstable. Now, when you are alive, you eat food. The food contains, among other things, carbon atoms. So, while you are alive, you take in, in a specific ratio, carbon. When you die, you're no longer taking up carbon. All right? So, the stable carbon remains. The unstable carbon undergoes a radioactive decay. And it goes, it changes into something else because it's going to emit particles or energy, all right? So when they use carbon dating to determine how old an organism is, they're going to have a look at the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14. And they know when an organism is alive, the ratio must be in a specific amount. So when an organ di organism dies, the carbon-14 starts to decay. So it becomes less and less and less and less. And then they can go and have a look at how long it takes to decay and they can go and reckon, okay, so much of this carbon has decayed, this organism has been dead for so long. Okay. If we go and have a look at isotopes of uranium, well, uranium-234, that's the mass number, protons plus neutrons, uranium-235, Protons plus neutrons, 238, protons plus neutrons. So, if uranium has 92 protons, how many neutrons does the 234 isotope have? Calculate. 234 minus 92 equals 142 neutrons. Is that right? Okay. The next one? 140? Three neutrons. And the last one? 146 neutrons. All right. You follow? Many elements have isotopes. Some are more well-known than others. Um, we won't work with all of the isotopes. Um, these are just a few. What do we use radioactive isotopes for? Carbon dating. I've just explained to you. All right. The ratio 
of the carbon-14, how has it changed? And then they use that to work out how old the object is, the living organism was. Now, radiotherapy, cobalt-60, is used to radiate cancer cells. Um, cobalt-60 emits gamma radiation, so it's not a particle, it's a wave. Now, particles, if I want to get a particle to go through something, the experiment we do with diffusion where we put the filter paper in and the gas particles can diffuse through, why can the gas particles get through? There are spaces. Do you understand? Now, when I want to shoot a particle into your body, a bigger particle is not going to be able to penetrate as good as a smaller particle. And if I have no particle at all, if it's a wave, I can direct it perfectly to one spot. Okay. So gamma radiation is then used to penetrate certain uh, tumors, cancerous tumors in the body. It destroys the cells immediately in the tumor, right? And then, um, well, they hope that you will be able to survive it. There's always some extra damage in the surrounding tissues, all right? It's not perfect. It is definitely more accurate than it was 20 years ago, all right? But there is always some uh, damage to the healthy cells as well. But they try and limit it to as little as possible. Isotopes are used to control the thickness of papers. When paper is made, we have huge rollers that roll it out to a certain thickness. When you buy paper, if you go to Walton's and you say you want to buy paper, um, you can go and buy from thin photostat paper to thicker qualities of paper. Do you, do you understand what I'm talking about? Yes. Um, now, in the factory where they manufacture it, there must be a mechanism that they have to measure to determine how thick the paper is. And what they do is, as the rolls of paper go rolling through the machine, above and below the machine they have, for example, an alpha or a beta emitter. If the paper is thin enough, the particle can go through and the um, presence of radiation is picked up. If it is too thick, the particle can't get through and an alarm goes off, the paper is too thick, so they have to roll it out. Thinner, they have to apply more pressure. Do you understand? Okay, rolling out metal tins, sheets of metal, etc. They use um, radioactive isotopes to tell them it's too thick. You must roll it out thinner. Okay, to get a certain thickness. Uranium-235 is the uranium that is used in nuclear power stations. It is the fuel. The uranium emits radiation. That energy is used to heat water. The water boils, it turns to steam, the steam drives a turbine, it generates electricity. I don't know the exact mass, but you can use the, the energy is very, very large because the energy from the uh, radioactive isotope is calculated energy equals mc squared from Einstein's theory, okay? Now, m is the mass of the particle that is shot out. But even though the mass of the particle is very tiny, this is the speed of light. And the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second, so you must square it. Okay? So it's 9 times 10 to the power 16. So even if you have a small mass, there will be loads of energy given off. All right? So uranium fuel is usually loaded into the nuclear power generator once every five or ten years. It depends on how much it generates. Yes, it lasts very, very long. Eventually, the big problem with nuclear fuel is the waste that is left after you've used it to generate electricity. It is still radioactive. And the radioactivity remains for a very long period of time, thousands of years. So it's very difficult to store this stuff safely. All right. 
to get rid of the radioactive waste. You can't burn it because the radiation then goes up into the air with the smoke. You can't throw it into water because it spreads with the water. experience is waiting at any time and finding it is as easy as one two three four if you're looking for a fresh feel-good movie you'll find it on one that is so true ready for all new action and a surge of adrenaline well all right it's waiting on two want something familiar like your favorite stars that's three and if you just want to keep the whole house happy with popular franchises and sequels, 4 is for everyone. <laughs> with streamlined, uninterrupted movie channels 24-7, legendary pop-up channels curated for the fans, and a massive on-demand selection of your favorite movies from the biggest studios. So you can ignite the most extraordinary part of an ordinary day, every day. Get ready. A unique movie experience is starting in on Mnet Movies for the love of movies. Share with us on hashtag learn on one. Tell us what you're learning and where you're learning it from. Send us your name and town to the One Africa TV's WhatsApp on 081-200-6659 or send an SMS to triple five. One Africa TV. It just gets better. When you watch football on Go TV, you know what you want. You want superstars, about that. the biggest names in the game, and of course, the best leagues in the world. Yes, you want explosive football action. And this new football season, we're serving it to you on a shiny new platter with our revamped Super Sport channels. All you have to do is tune in and we'll make it worth it. So get and stay connected to Go TV for football worth watching. Go TV, live it, love it. Start off with Unit 7, um, the building blocks of matter. It's page 115. Um, at the top, the introduction, everything around us is made up of atoms. Atoms, molecules, and ions are the building blocks of all materials. People, I think in grade 6 or 7 in science, you were taught that matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. All right. Now, when we did the kinetic theory, the first thing on that theory tells us all matter consists of particles. Now, what we are going to have a look at in this module is what are these particles? Now, depending on what we have, we know we get different types of bonds. You've done covalent bonding and you've done ionic bonding. Now, another one that we will be doing soon is metallic bonding. But now, depending on the type of bonding, it depends on what particles are 
make up the substance. We know, for example, if I have a covalently bonded substance, we refer to those particles as molecules. If I have an ionically bonded substance, the particles in a salt we refer to as ions. Okay. So, just in general, the particles that we get are atoms, ions, or molecules. All right. All right. People, just definitions. There's nothing new over here. An element is very simply a pure substance. Now, what's the difference between pure and impure? We've done it in the previous chapter. Pure substances have a fixed melting and boiling point. They have a fixed ratio. They are either elements or compounds. Okay? They are made up out of one type of particle. If it's water, we're referring to the particle is H2O. If it is oxygen, we're referring to the particle is O2. All right. Um, so elements then are pure substances that consist of one kind of atom. Remember the atoms that we have are found on the periodic table. All right. Um, you'll always be given a periodic table. You must just sort of know how to use it. So one kind of atom, and it cannot be broken down further by chemical means. Technically speaking, we can break an atom down. All right, but then we go to subatomic particles. If, if, if I go and break an atom apart, I end up with protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now, if I broke an atom of sodium apart, and I put all the protons in a bucket, and all the neutrons in a bucket, and all the electrons in a bucket, and then I went and took an atom of gold, and I broke it apart, and I took all those protons, and I threw it into the same bucket with the other protons, all the neutrons into the neutron bucket, and the electrons into the electron bucket. If I picked up a proton from the proton bucket, I wouldn't be able to say from which element it came. You understand? So, technically speaking, when we talk about the particles that matter is made up out of, we don't go to subatomic level. All right, so we then say that an element cannot be broken down by chemical means. Okay. All right, so mixtures. Mixtures, people, are impure, meaning it consists of more than one thing. If I want to bake a cake, if I have had someone mix the sugar and the salt in a bag, and I have to bake that cake using that sugar or salt, I wouldn't be able to say how much sugar or how much salt I'm using. It's not going to work. All right, it's not pure. My recipe won't work out. So, mixtures are impure. It consists of two or more kinds of substances. Now, these substances can be elements and elements. All right, it can be elements and compounds, or it can be compounds and compounds. Do you understand? And it is varying amounts in varying quantities. So we say then they are impure, two or more kinds of substances, and they are physically combined. In other words, there are no chemical bonds holding them together. If I take a bag of salt and I mix it with a bag of sugar, I've got a mixture of sugar and salt, but the sugar crystals are still uniquely sugar, and the salt crystals are still uniquely salt. They haven't gone and stuck onto each other by some other method. All right, they are still separate from each other. There are no chemical bonds, so then we say we can uh, separate them using physical processes that would be sorting by hand or filtering or uh, dissolving it in a solvent and then filtering the one that doesn't dissolve, etc. Okay, no chemical bonds are involved. Then, as a subheading under mixtures, what is an alloy? Molten mixture of metal. So are alloys pure? No, not in the technical sense in chemistry. Alloys can be made by mixing other metals in. Whether I mix a teaspoon of the other metal or whether I mix a bucket full of the other metal, I've got a mixture. You follow? 
Okay, so um, alloys are mixtures of metals and other elements, but it's very important. It is a mixture. We'll come back to that when we do the metals. All right. Compounds. The next one is a pure substance. All right. Can you see compounds and elements are pure? All right. Pure substances consisting of two or more elements chemically bonded. For example, ammonia consists of nitrogen bonded onto hydrogen. But between the nitrogen and the hydrogen, there are chemical bonds. We know they are non-metals, so we know what, would, what type of chemical bond would be between the nitrogen and the hydrogen? A covalent one, the one where we share electrons. Um, if I look at something like this, it's the chemical formula for vinegar. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It's three different elements. Now, this is an organic compound, so we write it in a slightly different way. All right. But all of these atoms, carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, they are chemically bonded. Also non-metal, so it will also be covalent bonds, bonding them together. Okay, so compounds, pure substances, Two or more elements that are chemically bonded. <clears throat> now, the formula of a compound, for example, NH3, CH3, COOH, that formula tells us in the first place which elements, all right? So which elements do we have over here? Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Which elements do we have over here? Nitrogen and hydrogen. You follow me? Okay, so which elements we have. It also tells us the exact proportion, let me do that, of each element in the compound. For example, in ammonia, the proportion of nitrogen is 1 to hydrogen 3, always. If I have a different proportion, if I had, for example, NH4, then I no longer have ammonia. I've got something else, then I've got the ammonium. Iron. All right. So the formula tells me exactly how many atoms of each element is in that compound. All right. And then just an example here, water, H2O. We know which elements? Hydrogen and oxygen. We know the proportion. Well, it's two hydrogens for every one oxygen. All right. Um, that then about the formula of a compound. Now, we are going to have a look at the reaction of sulfur with iron. Now, I'm going to come back to that in a moment, all right? Because there's a video clip, and uh, I first want to finish up, and then we will do the video clip. Okay, but what this part is about is that I can take two elements, iron and sulfur, that normally is fairly harmless lying around in a laboratory or wherever. Sulfur, uh, iron is a metal, shiny, gray. We get iron filings. There will be darkish little splinters of iron. Sulfur is a non-metal, and I don't know if you've ever seen sulfur. You can buy them at Agra in buckets. It's a, a yellow powder, all right? They sometimes use it to treat funguses on plants, etc. okay? So sulfur is a yellow powder. When I add them and I mix them up in a cup, nothing's going to happen. But if I went and I mixed them up in a fairly uh, specific proportion, all right? And I go and I heat it, all right? I've got it in a beaker and I heat it. We find that a chemical reaction occurs. And we can see this chemical reaction happen because the reaction that happens when it gets going, it's exothermic and it gives off heat and we can see this heat as a red glow that spreads through the mixture. And you can feel the mixture, it becomes very hot. All right. 
That is what the video clip will show us. So, just very simply, iron is a grey metal, sulphur is a yellow non-metal. Um, iron filings will be magnetic. I could pull them out with a magnet from the yellow powder. All right? The yellow powder is not magnetic. So they say when these two elements are mixed and then heated, we get a chemical reaction. What is very important when there is a chemical reaction? It implies we are making and or breaking chemical bonds. Very important. A chemical reaction implies the making and or breaking of chemical bonds. So, um, starting off, they tell us that there is a red glow that spreads through the mixture. An exothermic reaction is one that gives off energy. The energy is normally in the form of heat, or we can see it as light. Or it can be sound. Okay. Chemical reactions, mostly heat or light. We get a new substance, iron sulfide. Iron sulfide looks different to the iron filings and to the yellow color of the sulfur that it originally was made up out of. And we will see in the video clip, it's like a dark, dark brown, blackish substance that is formed. All right, if you tested it with a magnet, we will find iron sulfide is not at all magnetic, even though it contains iron. But now we get new properties, because over here we have a new substance. This iron sulfide will have its own specific melting and boiling point. It will have its own specific density um, that will differ from that of iron and sulfur because once we get new chemical bonds the stuff changes and it forms something unique okay a new compound is formed and this compound is different from the elements iron and sulfur that were mixed together to make it which brings us then to a comparison between mixtures and compounds now don't go and confuse this in one of the previous units we had a look at pure and Impure, there is overlap, because pure substances are elements and compounds. All right, mixtures are impure. But now specifically, we go and have a look at mixtures and compounds. You can go and say compounds are pure and mixtures are impure. But then you mustn't go and confuse it with the impure properties. All right, so mixtures, components may be separated by physical means. That means there are no chemical bonds that you make or break. That would be filtering, using a magnet to pull out magnetic stuff, uh, dissolving one thing in a solvent where another one doesn't dissolve and filtering it off, etc. So compounds can be separated by physical means, no chemical bonds. Because there are no chemical bonds between the different constituents, their amounts can vary. I can take a cup of water and I can add one spoon of sugar to it and I will have sugar water. It's a mixture. I can go and add two spoons of sugar to it. I've still got sugar water. I can go and add ten spoons to it. I've still only got sugar water. The concentration of the sugar is increasing, but it's still a mixture of sugar and water. So we say the composition can vary. It's not fixed. It's not like if I have water, the composition of water is always two hydrogens to one oxygen. There are no chemical reactions that take place when a mixture is formed. If I take my iron and my sulfur and I mix it up with my spoon, I've still only got iron and sulfur. To make it react chemically, to get the chemical bonds between the iron and sulfur, I needed to heat it fairly strongly. And then we can see there's a chemical reaction. But before I start heating it, there is no chemical reaction. All right. So no chemical reactions take place when we make mixtures. In other words, will it become hotter or colder? The properties come from the individual substances that make up the mixture. If I have water and I have sugar, sugar is sweet, water is fairly tasteless. So if I add the sugar to the water, it gets a sweet taste. All right, which is a mixture of the two properties. <laughs> All right, compounds. 
Compounds may be separated by chemical means. I can take water and add a little bit of acid to it, and then I can take two electrodes and connect it up onto a power supply, and I can make water break up into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. All right? But I need electricity to do that because I need to put in quite a bit of energy to break up the compound because I must break chemical bonds and new bonds must be formed. All right, so um, we can separate components in a compound using chemical reactions or chemical means because we must break chemical bonds. Sometimes it's very easy to separate the parts in a compound, like water, it's very easy to do that. We can do it in a laboratory, you don't need a lot of energy to do that. Other compounds, something like aluminium oxide, is actually quite difficult to break up because it requires a very large amount of energy. So depending on how much energy is needed, some things are easier to separate than others. Um, the composition is always the same. Water will always be H2O. Vinegar will always be CH3COOH. Table salt will always be NaCl, sodium chloride. The moment we have different amounts, then we no longer have that substance. It's something else. When a compound is formed, there are always chemical reactions chemical changes. So if I start with iron and I take sulfur and I make it react and I get iron sulfide, iron sulfide will have its own unique properties. Okay, Totally different from iron and sulfur because chemical changes have occurred. Melting and boiling points would be differ for, different, for example. Then when we make a compound, new properties are formed. If I take hydrogen gas, and I make it burn with oxygen. It burns with a blue flame and it produces water. All right? So new properties are formed. I know, for example, that hydrogen is a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas. Oxygen, colorless, odorless, tasteless gas. Hydrogen is less dense. Oxygen is slightly more dense than hydrogen. But water, it's not a gas. It's a liquid with a fairly high melting and boiling point. Right, so we have new properties that would be different from the components it was made of. Definition of a crystal lattice. Orderly arrangement of particles. Once again, those particles can be molecules. If I have iodine, a crystal of iodine, the orderly arrangement of the particles would actually be an orderly arrangement of molecules in the crystal lattice. If the um, particle, if the solid was sodium chloride, the particles would be sodium ions and chloride ions. Do you follow? All right, so it doesn't matter whether it's molecular or ionic. A crystal lattice is simply the orderly arrangement of particles, the part particles being atoms, ions, or molecules. And crystal lattice we get in the solid state. In liquids and gases, the particles have partially overcome the attractive forces and they move randomly. No. So there's no order to the arrangement. Now this lattice, this crystal lattice, can be molecular. Okay? That would be something like iodine. Remember, iodine is a diatomic molecule. And there's another iodine molecule. And these molecules will be arranged in an orderly pattern known as the crystal lattice. Okay? That would be molecular. The giant that they refer to would be something like diamonds. Diamond has got four bonding places because it's made up out of carbon. Each carbon is bonded onto four others in three dimensions to form a very big structure. We get tiny little diamonds. They still contain carbon, and we get bigger diamonds. They also only contain carbon bonded in a specific way. All right. So then the amount can vary. But we talk about giant covalent structures, and we will have a look at them also a little bit further on.
they say in a giant lattice, the pattern is repeated endlessly. For example, in sodium chloride, I can get a tiny little grain of sodium chloride and I can grow big crystals of sodium chloride. It's just a pattern that is repeated in a bigger crystal. Alloys, molten mixture of metals, as we've said the other day, uh, um, just previously, of other metals or carbon. In alloys, the regular arrangement of atoms, in other words, the crystal lattice, is disrupted. And here I have a picture of what it can be. Here I have a very orderly arrangement of particles. And then this pattern gets disrupted because I have a bigger particle in between. This would be, for example, a carbon atom between sodium ions. Okay. Um, here's just another picture to show you. Um, <laughs> here we have our orderly crystal lattice that is very definitely disrupted by different sized particles. And that is why, in general, alloys are harder, less malleable than pure metals. Why are they less malleable? Malleable means they can be pulled into threads. Why can they be pulled into threads? Because these layers, eh? Yes, malleable, oh, same thing, malleable and ductile. Ductile is drawn into threads, malleum, you can heat it with a hammer without shattering. But why? Because these layers in the crystal lattice can slip over each other. But if we have alloyed it, there are different sized atoms and the layers get stuck, they can't slide. All right, so alloy is generally harder and less malleable. People, properties of alloys, they are usually stronger and harder and more resistant to corrosion, rusting. They are also poorer conductors than pure metals. Why would they be pure, poorer conductors? Well, in a metal that is conducting electricity, the electrons can move because there is a specific orderly arrangement. So the spaces are orderly as well. But if I go and disrupt the pattern, if I am an electron there, there's going to be more friction. It's going to bump into other particles. So that metal will get hotter because the energy of the electron is going to be converted to heat in the particle that's going to be able to vibrate more. All right. So it will be a poorer con I think it's the opening of Oshakati Stadium. Mm -hmm. Then I was a lead singer there. Then this DJ come, DJ Remind, mm -hmm. came to me and was like, Hi, don't you want to be a solo artist? I said, What is solo? <laughs> <laughs> ah, ladies and gentlemen, my name is DJ Siam Bramas Grim, Kwampiri Perez, Kamp Kapilez Ritene, from the Mighty Wings. Hey, Dala is joining us in the hot seat. She said it right. She said it right. She said it right. <laughs> Welcome to the tribe. Thank you so much. Hi to Hall and Namibia. Welcome to the tribe on One Africa TV. My name is Shay the Goddess and I keep your company every Friday along with some of Namibia's biggest artists right here on this platform. <laughs>
This song is dedicated to Mother Namibia, the founding father of the Namibian Revolution, Dr. Shafi Kunasem Nyoma, the second former president, Dr. Ifike Punye Pohamba, and the patron of the Namibian National Liberation Veteran Association, the third president, Dr. Hage Genko, the president of the republic, and the founder of Harambe Prosperity Plan for Namibia, the first lady, Meme Monica Genkos, and the veterans of the liberation struggle of Namibia, the sons and daughters of the soil. My God bless Namibia.
See you. 